was a game of chance which many people played. The object marked the numbers exactly as they say. <laughs> he doesn't like for people to look at his cards because he's very superstitious. I leave, give me that for good luck. She said, Grandma, this is going to make you win. <laughs> She's in Las Vegas. <laughs> Bingo's involved in the church basement, so you've got the religious aspect involved in it. I don't know really about other faiths. In Catholicism, having some fun with gambling, there's no sin against that. This was not something that my grandmother or I had done when it was church related. And this was actually gambling. And 10 is $30. Anybody who goes into that hall with their last few dollars hoping to win are crazy. Gambling is that dirty four letter word, hope. When I was hoping, please let me win, it was hopeless hope. About 80% of our income comes from gambling. Bingos. Of the 6,200 charities that are part of our organization and dependent on bingo funds, if bingo was made illegal tomorrow, half of them would be either out of business or seriously considering getting out of business. Don't play bingo tonight. Mother, stay home with Daddy and me. Don't play bingo tonight. Mother, we need your company. Poor Daddy sits nightly with tears. The Knights of Columbus run the oldest bingo hall still operating in Canada. The Catholic Club turned this ballroom into a bingo parlor in the early 50s to raise money for local charities. We open our doors every morning at 7.30. People come in, believe it or not, they start coming in 7.30, 8 o'clock. They have their seats, they know each other by name, they play their little card games, and then our snack bar opens, they have breakfast. The uh, charities that we have here all benefit from it. And then, of course, uh, it all trickles back down when the charities whichever one it is, do their work out in the uh, community. Peace. There's a little rhyme which explains the Catholic attitude towards bingo and the social fun that goes with it. Where'er the Catholic sun doth shine, there's music, laughter, and good red wine. At least I've always found it so. Benedicamos Domino. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Them on. It took like six hours, just forever. I'll never do it again. Down the street from the Knights of Columbus, a different kind of bingo is in progress, raising funds for the People with AIDS Foundation. And now, please welcome back to the stage, Sister Amelia! You can go to the Knights of Columbus and win $5,000, uh, if you're lucky. Here, it's a lot more fun. Our next number is under the fold. 69! I went to the Knights 
Jesse Columbus was playing real big out 69 was the number, and I'm there going, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> they didn't like that. <laughs> I don't know, have you been to a regular bingo? You know it's I-22, O-70. And they've got like 15 cards and they're going crazy and oh shit should be the name of the game. Because everybody says when somebody else does a bingo. <laughs> I remember used to go to church bingos. The jackpot used to be an ashtray. And the big full house bingo at night uh, used to be a couple of tickets to the neighborhood movies. And we enjoyed it. That was like, but it's grown out from that proportion. Today, bingo took its place with the gambling atmosphere. Bingo may have a historical image as a small time church game, but it was a big time commercial success right from the beginning. A little girl sat on her daddy's knee. In 1929, a New York toy manufacturer discovered a game called Beano at a country fair. He gave the game a snazzier name and sold it to North American parishes. Promoters brought in the business. The law said something that bingo is illegal except if it is run in a fairground or carnival and or on an occasional basis for a charitable or religious organization. Don't play bingo tonight, mother, stay home with daddy and me. The word occasional was still all in a gray area, and uh, we started running bingo seven nights a week. The churches were making so much money, they made us an offer we couldn't refuse, which is a reversal on the uh, godfather. <laughs> the poor father sat in his khaki suit. A Bingo fever swept Canada during the Second World War, raging on through the decades that followed. Poor daddy sits nightly with tears in his eyes, just wondering if you will come home with. In 1969, the criminal code was amended, allowing provinces to officially license bingo to charities. Today, it's a gambling institution without a gambling image, mostly because of its Catholic connections. For North American Catholics, bingo has been uh, a rather important uh, source of revenue generation to assist a variety of uh, church and social uh, projects. Historically, since the beginning of the Christian church, Christians have been concerned not only with, quote, saving souls, but with saving and caring for whole persons, body and soul. And that has led to an enormous investment of resources. The end never justifies the means. If you're structuring something upon greed and avarice and covetousness, which are really antisocial forces, uh, you can't get good coming out of that. You know, there's an old saying that says you can't do God's work in the devil's way. how big bingo is in Canada. For example, every month we produce over one billion bingo cards. And annually, our company throughout the world produces close to 50 billion bingo cards. And to give an idea how big that is, or how much that is, if you just took all the bingo cards and laid them end to end, it would loop from the earth to the moon and back six times. Walking out a winner puts me right up on cloud nine With bonanza in my pocket, I'm feeling my Legend has it, a Columbia University math professor went insane after expanding the number combinations for early bingo cards. Today, Canadians wager 10 times more per capita than Americans on bingo. Two and a half billion dollars a year comes into halls like this one, owned by Bingo Country, the biggest chain in Canada. When we bring in people into our facilities, they walk in and they go, wow, I didn't know bingo was like this. 
and they're just shocked at our facilities, the number of people, and everything else that we have within the bingo hall. How the product is played, the customers that are there, the seating, you know, and they're just shocked. Just literally shocked. Bingo Country owns the hall, but by law, the charities run the games and make the most money. This bingo funds the Seeds of Hope, a charity that teaches computer skills to people with problems getting work. Fundraising these days is so difficult. Um, people expect something in return for their donation. Um, phone campaigns, door-to-door -door campaigns, all heavily, heavily used. And the one advantage to bingo is people are going in, playing the game, probably don't even realize they're donating to charity, and having some entertainment for the dollars that they're contributing. Canadian charities get an average of 60% of the profits after prizes are paid out, about $400 million a year. As of now, really, bingo is about the only financial support the Seeds of Hope has. The greatest benefit is that it's reasonably reliable. You know six months in advance approximately what the revenues are going to be and how much effort is going to have to be made to raise them. There's a core uh, customer base, people that love playing bingo, and will go to great lengths to play bingo. And if you've been in the halls, you, you, know, you know that. Statistics Canada reports bingo players are gambling's biggest spenders per capita, yet they also have the least to spend. Predominantly bingo players are among the poorest Canadians. Did you want to go to bingo this afternoon? Well, <clears throat> if you can, let me know. I gotta go pick up Matthew in a bit. Well, I worked in the restaurant industry since I was 18 until a couple of years ago. Losing my job, it was like, oh my God, I have no lifeline now. What am I going to do? And normally I would have just gone right back out there and got another job at another restaurant. But one of the last things my uh, general manager said to me when I was walking out was, I don't recommend that you go back into this business. And that kind of threw me for a loop. I had to go on assistance. And that wasn't a very pleasant thing because uh, it's something I never, you know, planned on doing. Cindy first played bingo with her mother when she was 16, but she only started playing regularly after she lost her job. It's an escape from the pressures of raising three kids alone on $1,100 a month for social assistance income. Boy, it'd be really nice to win the big one, like the $3,000 jackpot. That would take care of all Max's hockey. Uh, I could finish paying off the dentist bill. I allow myself maybe $100 a month. Like, that's my money to sort of do what I want with, you know, if I, I could buy clothes, I guess. But once that money's gone, that's it. There's no more bingo for that month. So what's the most you'd play in a week? Oh, the most I've played in a week? Like, you know, if I'm winning or something like that? Oh, God. I've been known to go, like, to three sessions. Like, go in the, go, you know, lunch. Go at 7, go at 10. So, and then go back again the next day or something. It's a different kind of thinking when you're playing the game. You're not thinking about like 
geez, you know, Brian needs braces, or, you know, where am I going to get the money for hockey? Or you can just sort of tune out and you're just concentrating on playing the game, the numbers. Bingo players fall into a different category of gambling. And when they use the word passive, that, yes, they can be very excited about playing bingo, but you're not having to demonstrate your skill to someone. It's all based on luck, rather than for those who are an active gambler, which is somebody who is at table games, who is playing blackjack, which is um, a lot of bravado saying, I'm the best and I'm going to beat the house and this is very challenging and I have to win because if I don't win, then I'm going to be a failure. Whereas the individual who is there and who is playing bingo, um, um, doesn't have to be reinforced about their low self-esteem. J51. <laughs> see what I mean? I can't win, see? It's fixed. It's fixed. As usual, I never win. No? I come here because uh, I like giving them my money. <laughs> you take a chance, you know, you come here to try to win, but usually I don't win very much. And 35. I'm not a winner. At bingo, no, you just sit patiently and hope for the best. Hope you call my number. But I don't get, ever get excited about it. You know, Mike Harris? He promised the senior citizens a race. You know when we're going to get the race? In the year 2001. So I got to come here and try to get some money. You can't go into a bingo hall and not recognize that the people that are playing the bingo are the very people who have the least amount of money to put down on something like that. I think they take advantage of people. They take advantage of the fact that people don't have enough income to survive and are willing to, to shell out, you know, a, a few bucks for a bingo card for, for the, the possibility of, of scoring big when, you know, in the end, it's the organization or the charity or whoever is, 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 you know, organizing the event that's pocketing most of the money. To make money for children's charities, the Variety Club owns two bingo halls in Toronto. Both are located in low-income neighborhoods. I never ask anyone what their income is when they come in, so I wouldn't really know what lower income was. What is lower income? Does someone who earned $50,000 a year? If, if someone has made a purchase of something, um, to me that states that they've got money and they can afford it. We're here to help children who need our help. And if we can't help the weakest in our society, there's something wrong with us. There are customers that are playing in the halls from all income levels. And I think it's very unfair to, to put a stereotype to the kind of uh, income level of a bingo player. Um, certainly the OLC research has shown that it's, it's middle income and above, which is your average person. This research in Ontario Lottery Corporation's study actually tells a different story. Bingo draws its highest numbers from the lowest income brackets. In Toronto, for example, bingo halls are overwhelmingly found in areas with the highest concentrations of people living below the poverty line. G60. Certainly we are, uh, attendance does increase for uh, maybe an eight or ten day period at the end of the month. You know you're really going to be busy. And what's, what happens at the end of the month? What happens at the end of the month? You're really going to drag that out of me, aren't you? Uh, well, there's a lot of welfare checks come out. Everyone seems to have more money. So a lot of that money, uh, disposable income, would come into most bingo halls. So why did you come today? You guys have got to check today, so you get the chance to come to bingo. <laughs> Non-disability, eh? B5. And you got enough. You pay your rent and food and that. And every time you come here once, that's it, you're broke. <laughs> I 
Well, I'm on low income myself, and I usually wait till the end of the month. If I don't win, at least I know it goes to charity for those who are less fortunate than I am. There has been expressed concern we've about people who perhaps can't afford to spend their money at bingos and that it's patently inappropriate or unfair for governments, charities and commercial operators to, uh, to benefit from that type of activity. Uh, the, um, I think the response is relatively simple and clear. The uh, uh, activity is, is legal under the criminal code, uh, simple statement of fact, uh, and under the provincial legislation. But I think more importantly, um, those who have that particular point of view uh, are really trying to, in their own minds, legislate and dictate what people can and can't do with their money. Oh, Cindy, you shouldn't be here. That $30 could be going towards the dentist. I never thought I'd be in this kind of boat, you know, with, uh, like, no money kind of thing. You know, I always had a job. I always took care of myself. I always took care of the kids. So now, I, now it's kind of scary. I'm really quite aware that a lot of the people that are playing bingo are don't have a lot of money and they're spending it on this apparently is their is their recreation and, uh, and as I said the only rationale for it is that it's going to a good cause. Seeds of Hope started up in 1991. The mandate of Seeds of Hope was to um, basically to help people overcome employment barriers. As they're laid off their job ends they come into the world now and they find that technology has passed them by and uh, they find it's quite a different world out there now where almost every job requires some kind of computer skills. Double click on my computer. I need to get back to work. I spoke to my worker about going back to school or getting some kind of like career. You know, I need to have some, I guess, some sit down with somebody and say, okay, you know, this is what you should be looking at or doing. Our average student has been unemployed about 18 months. Any self-confidence that they had is, is gone. They were working people. And now they're, they're relying on the social assistance system for their lives. You know, even though I'm a 39 and I'm a parent and, and I strive for, you know, my kids not to be insecure and to, to be secure, I'm still really insecure. And I don't know what I'm good at. Just I thought I was doing good when I needed food. Yeah, we did. <laughs> Boy, I gotta do something with my life. Look what it's come to. Bingo. Here we are, a nonprofit organization that is trying to help people on the margins of our society, people who have been marginalized. And in some respects, we are using uh, money, the profits, okay, from bingos, when if you, if you look at the people who attend bingos, they are probably not much better off than the people we're dealing with here, the people that we're trying to help here. And whenever, you know what, and every every time, whenever it's ever high like that, it, it always goes. goes like that. It's all over. Could have been going home with 500 bucks each. Instead, yeah. we're going home with Zippo. When I walk out of there, it's like, well, it's, you know, I usually say to Sherry, like, geez, why didn't, you know, G51 come out? Like, once I'm out of there, it's like I want to just forget about it. Like, I just don't want to dwell on the fact that I lost again. <laughs> I'm a loser. Big loser. So did you have any luck None. And the last game, Sherry needed B9. Like for a while, she got down on this card really fast. She only needed five numbers. And he slowly called them. And she got down, she needed just B9, but he called three and one. Not hers. So she wasn't too happy. She was actually uh, pretty good today. She didn't do any of her rocking, and she didn't do any of her praying. 
that she normally does? I didn't know she did that. She does. Praying do that, to the bingo god to give her her numbers. You don't do that, do you? No. Maybe inside my head. <laughs> so do you want to play bingo when you're a maid? Well, my mom's always, she always, she told me like when I was little that like um, when I turned 14, she would take me to the bingo hall because I was, because I would like look 16. And then when I turned like 14, I was like, oh, can I go to bingo now? And she's like, no, they changed the age to 18. So I got to wait like another year. But I don't know. I don't think I'm going to be, I don't know. I'll have to see if I'm like as into it as she is because I don't know. But I just want to try it because she seems to, you know get a kick out of it, but I don't know if I'll be so addicted. But <laughs> yeah, Ashley always makes a joke that I need bingo, on, you know, anonymous. Yeah, they're going to go book me into a bingo anonymous. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of people addicted to bingo, but it's better being addicted to bingo than going to casinos and being addicted to that. A lot of people are addicted to it. I was for a while. Well, if you look at the way that most bingo players play bingo, it, it is often referred to as soft gaming, um, which is, a, I guess, a strange term. But what basically is meant by soft gaming is you can't chase your losses. If you go to a casino and you lose a couple of hundred bucks on the poker tables, you can go and you can go and get another 200 bucks and you can lose it again. Y you can't do that in bingo. There are only so many bingo cards you can play. Uh, when you go to bingo, you think it's nickel and dime, but it's surprising how much that money adds up where when it comes to uh, some women are spending 60 to 80 dollars a session and if they stay for three four sessions a day it adds up I was asked by someone who was a casino player you know who played big money how can you possibly lose a house playing bingo and I said well <laughs> I did it. It really wasn't that hard. I was about um, $25,000 in debt, and my husband went to buy himself a new truck, and he was going to pay cash for it, and I, and I had to tell him that the cash wasn't there, that there was no money in the bank for his truck, and I managed to, to lie my way out of that. I just mismanaged bills, and... Um, you know, the house taxes I had let slide in this, and I came up with just all kinds of stories. I had no self-esteem. I was lying, cheating, stealing, you know, whatever I had to do, I did. We took out a loan to pay off those debts, and as soon as that, you know, we had a loan and I had no more debts, so to speak, I mean, it was all in one big loan, um, that kind of was, you know, gave me the go-ahead to just, wow, I can go crazy. To some degree, I would say it cost me my marriage, my self-respect. I, I don't know exact dollar amounts. Um, probably about $40,000, though, at the end. Losing big is all relative. For bingo players with little to spend in the first place, it's a short fall to the bottom, just part of the cycle of poverty. No conclusive research has ever been done on problem bingo playing. But conservative estimates reveal that problem gambling affects between 10 and 15 percent of players on average. That's a quarter of a million Canadians with bingo addiction problems. If you would take a magnet, a symbolic magnet, and sniff out all compulsive and pathological gamblers, then a large number of the gaming industry would go broke because uh, that is one of the significant differences, that they are uh, the highest players. No one wants to voluntarily depart with his profit. Now, if you have a bingo operator and he says, I have a business, I do this, what do I care? So we have to convince them, yes, you do care. Today, only one company in the bingo industry is planning an official policy to deal with problem gambling. Uh, I'm not aware of whether or not um, someone has that type of problem right now. Uh, because it's just an issue that we 
uh, we didn't pay a lot of attention to. I mean, in terms of, uh, of uh, you know, recognizing it, uh, and that's really why we're getting into the program. Bingo Country's responsible gambling program will train employees to refer customers to hotlines and counselors, but only if the customer comes asking for help. We're taking a reasonably conservative approach in terms of our literature. I mean, we're not going to be having huge posters all over the place, which is going to scare people. Um, in fact, uh, at, at this point, we're only really thinking of developing uh, pamphlets, pamphlets which, which would be, uh, you know, reasonably isolated, but, um, but, but still accessible to the uh, customers and so forth when they come into the facilities. I haven't seen cases. I can honestly say hand on my heart, no, I haven't. But people have told me there are people with addictions. But if we've noticed it here, then we would take specific action to it. Well, you see, the nice thing about when you do that, though, is you win three times as much or twice as much, depending on what you do. What about the people who have walked away with 300,000, 400,000, or 500,000, who have helped their families in a positive way? You see, everybody wants to concentrate the negative. Why don't we look at the positive? I'm fed up with people telling me nasty, bad stories about it. I'd rather someone tell me the good stories about it. Stop for a cappuccino on your way here with the three, two. A new star has been sighted. Scientists are calling it a superstar, and it's headed this way. Calculations are it will hit Ontario bingo halls. It's the biggest thing to hit bingo halls in years. Minimum $25,000 jackpot. New superstar bingo. Halls across Ontario are hooking up to play Superstar Bingo, a giant, electronically linked game run by the provincial government. The industry wanted bigger games, but only the government can legally operate computerized bingo. Last call, Superstar. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. It's a <laughs> the other day it was five hundred and something thousand. Some lady in Sudbury won. Imagine winning that. And ten dollars change. Thank you very much. Because of our mandate, which is to raise money for government and its broader uses, once we get involved in the activity and actually make what we believe to be a significant contribution, that there then should be a component of profit for the government. Hopefully, we can come up with ideas that will increase the pie for everybody and draw new players in. Tonight's game is very exciting because $625,000. I never won that kind of money before. I've never seen that amount before. But if I didn't, well, I'd use it wisely. I would. I wouldn't just come here and blow it in the bingo hall. No way, I'd take it and run. Guys like me, I work my, you know what, every day, and it's nice to have a chance to win a little bit of extra cash, you know, have a better future for myself. If you get the lucky card, you'll get it, eh? But if you don't, you won't get it. I'm hoping to get, get it, or the consolation, either one, you know? I'm hoping to. The same with the rest there too. With Superstar Bingo, many of the players like the fact that there's big jackpots. And I think in spite of, of bingo players not liking to change very much, um, the game has been reasonably well received in a year and a half. With almost uh, $80 million in sales last year, um, that's a lot of people buying the game, whether they like it or not. It is drawing in people with hype. They're bigger on pushing their game than we are. We're not about to run around saying, here, go ahead, buy another card, increase your chances, and yet the government will, or the government agency responsible for the bingo, will send a fax saying, here are different ways you can get people to buy more cards. They have an average on what people spend a night. They want to get that average up. Here's a way to do it. They can be slightly ruthless. Some would find it ruthless that all superstars' big bonus events have been scheduled right after the social assistance checks come out. There is uh, absolutely no way that poor people are targeted 
for uh, any of the games that we offer. Um, and certainly uh, in terms of, um, of Superstar Bingo or Bingo generally, we, we produce a product that we think is attractive to the people who want to play bingo. Well, because it's under government gaming, we didn't have the same kind of restrictions. Superstar was really, was just set up to be a first step in looking at some innovation to the industry. Superstar Bingo is the movement into electronic gaming as we see it. Electronic bingo creates a limitless opportunity to gamble. Today, they can only play physically so much, and they get done, and then, you know, if they had a chair on wheels, they'd run it back and forth across a table, might be able to play more cards. When they play in electronics, it, it breaks those boundaries. They can play a lot more than what you can physically do, but, I mean, that's the excitement about electronics. The industry's reassurances that bingo deals in soft gaming crumble in the path of its ambitions. But that just means fewer obstructions to the money flooding in for Canada's charities. We don't feel good about it, but it keeps us going. We've justified this in our minds by saying, well, by believing that the good we do is greater than the harm that the bingos may be doing. I-21. Uh, we're not doing anything wrong. We're not doing anything illegal. If we were doing something that terrible, these people wouldn't be coming in here. They wouldn't be participating. It's a fun afternoon or a fun evening. And the charities get the, the opportunity to derive some revenue from it. So long may the customer keep coming. public seems to accept that as a form of having revenue raised by government. If they're going to participate anyhow, we might as well manage it, control it, and turn the proceeds over to uh, what we view to be good causes. Would people be going and working in these smoky halls uh, if there was some other way to get the money to do the work? How are those things should be funded? Shouldn't they be taxed from the upper level of society? Yeah. but. Uh, is the Canadian population, the Ontario population, willing to pay direct taxation to help? Don't think so. Gambling obviously is big, okay? The government is taking in hundreds of millions of dollars, okay? There are those that would argue, well, that's keeping our taxes down. But is that the way that we want to fund our society? Is through gambling? Is that what we really want to do, is fund things through gambling, fund our community agencies, our, our community services through gambling, because that is what is happening now. was fixing herself for a spree down at the community hall. Don't play bingo tonight, mother, stay home with daddy and me. Don't play bingo tonight, mother, we need your company. Poor daddy sits nightly with tears in his eyes. Just wondering if you're welcome home with first prize. Hey, Brian. Didn't work. <laughs> <laughs>